Hello, dear students. So this is the twelfth lecture on William Shakespeare's The Tragedy of Macbeth, and we are approaching the end of this series of lectures on Macbeth. So now, in maybe perhaps two or three more lectures, it will be over. So we move on from where we left. That is. Act four, scene three. Now, Act four, scene three begins in England, a room in the king's palace. The room in the king's palace is basically the room in King Edward the Confessor's palace. If you look at the time frame of Macbeth, the original story that Shakespeare found from Holinshed's Chronicles, then you will see that it happened. About the same time as the Norman Conquest, okay, a decade earlier. That is, Macbeth's time frame lasts from 1040 to 1050. <coughs> Excuse me. And these ten years were actually a very good rule for Scotland. However, Shakespeare has changed the history to a certain degree. And I perhaps have spoken about it in my earlier lectures, in at least in the introductory part. Because Shakespeare does not properly follow the historical paradigm, because he does not wish to write a historical play, but a play based on history. A historical play is primarily that which follows history in total, that is in point by point. However, a play based on history often takes imaginative leaps from the actual historical happenings, and it develops the play according to the playwright's desires. Okay. So without further ado, let us go into the scene. Act 4, scene 3. Now this is a very crucial scene. It might seem a bit boring, but this is a very crucial scene for understanding the political atmosphere of Macbeth. Quite like Act 1, Scene 2, over here we have an echo of the political disruptions in the Scottish affairs. Because you see, just like in Act 1, Scene 2, here we realize that in Act 1, Scene 2, we realize what was the present for the Scottish uh, kingdom. And here we shall have a glimpse of the future of the Scottish household. So let's read. Enter Malcolm and Macduff. So Macduff has already fled and he has reached England to meet with Malcolm. Let us seek out some desolate shade and there whip our sad bosoms empty. So Malcolm wishes to commemorate this meeting, to take the opportunity of this meeting to kind of commemorate their father. However, Macduff is still in the air of disbelief. Because you see, as we have already learned after Duncan's murder, that the near in blood, the nearer bloody. And therefore, Macduff does not trust anyone. And you will see that this distrust, this mistrust shall also be seen in Malcolm very soon. And here, two parleying parties would use their wit and their intellect to judge and assess the situation for each other. Let us rather hold. We can see that many people are dying on a daily basis, and therefore, it is not. Uh, very difficult for us in this pandemic situation to understand the meaning of this situation. That each new morn, new widows cry. Each new morning, we have newer widows who are wailing for their husbands. Each new morning, we hear news, is, news of death. However, in this context, the issue is with Macbeth because Macbeth commits murder rampantly right now. And he has lost all forms of moral qualms which stopped him earlier, which would have stopped him in his path. 
Macbeth has lost all the doubts that he earlier suffered, and now he is potent and potent with his perversion. Malcolm, what I believe, I'll wail. What now believe? And what I can redress, as I shall find the time to friend, I will. What you have spoke, it may be so, perchance. This tyrant, whose sole name blisters our tongues, was one thought honest. You have loved him well, had he had not touched you yet. I am young, but something you may deserve of him through me and wisdom to offer up a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry god. As I have said that there is a general air of political mistrust, and therefore Malcolm says that up till now we thought that Macbeth was honest, and the reports of deaths that you are giving me, let me believe that they are true. Let me believe that you have come here with good intention. Let me believe that you have come here to make friends out of me. Let me believe that you are standing for the fate, the destiny of Scotland, which has run amok, and now you wish to set it aright. However, how can I not bring into my mind the question or the issue that perhaps you are one of his spies sent over here to lure me in because of my youth and my inexperience and why shouldn't I believe that you are going to hand me over to him just to gain his favor because you are still favored of him since he has not touched you yet. And you can see that this general mood of disbelief is very contagious in the rebellious parties because they do not know whom to trust. The near in blood, the nearer bloody. That's the motive of Macbeth. <coughs> and Macduff says, I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge, but I shall crave your pardon, that which you are, my thoughts cannot transpose. Angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. Through all the foul would wear the brows of grace, yet grace must still look so. So Malcolm says that forgive me if I am wrong about you, but you must also remember that while the angels, they are the fairest of God's creations, you must remember that the brightest of the angels, that is Lucifer and Elzebub, they fell. They fell from grace. And grace is what runs our civilization from uh, making it a very chaotic place. Grace is what saves us from chaos, from absolute malarkey. However, I cannot trust you. You might not be treacherous, but you might be duped by Macbeth as well because he is treacherous. He perhaps might have sent you that you do not tell Malcolm. You bring him here and I will relinquish my throne and I will give it to Malcolm and perhaps you have foolishly believed him. So you see, this general mood is very tense, is full of suspicion. Macbeth, I have lost my hopes. Perchance, even there where I did find my doubts, why in that rawness left your wife and child, those precious motives, those strong knots of love, without leave taking? I pray you, let not my jealousies be your dishonors, but mine own safeties. You may be rightly just, whatever I shall think. So now Malcolm says that don't take me otherwise. I am jealous of you because you have a family. You have knots of love. And I do not have anything. Because basically I am bereft of my father. We do not hear about Duncan's wife at all. So perhaps she is dead. 
tunnel bane is in ireland so there is very little communication between the two and therefore you see malcolm says that do not let my jealousies kind of stifle your honest nature if you are honest but think of this that i have lost my father the king and my life is in danger and therefore i must always be on if you are righteous then no matter whatever I, whatever i say your righteousness does not get questioned it's only that for my own security that i have to participate in such a grueling encounter with you and then macduff says bleed bleed poor country great tyranny lay thou thy basis sure for goodness dare not check thee where thou thy wrongs that title is a feared fair the well lord i would not be the villain that thou thinkest for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp and the reach east to boot and look macduff has basically lost his composure when malcolm said that you have left your wife and your child without even taking their leave you have fled from your country and you wish me to believe you don't you think i will be hampering my own security if i believe you right now and then macduff says that if you behave in such a way you who should have been our savior then bleed poor country because there is no one else who can claim you back from the tyrannies of macbeth and macbeth is now planning an expansion towards the east as well look i said to you that this scene is very important because it kind of gives us glimpses into the political aspirations of scotland itself just like the opening scene of macbeth talks about uh, the political aspirations of denmark what is going on and so on and so forth similarly shakespeare gives us subtle hints regarding the political milieu of a play through these subtle suggestions Malcolm, be not offended. I speak not as in absolute fear of you. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each new day a gash is added to her wounds. I think with all, there would be hands uplifted in my right, and here from gracious England have I offer of goodly thousands. But for all this, when I shall tread upon the tyrant's head. or wear it on my sword yet my poor country shall have more vices than it had before more suffer and more sundry ways than ever by him that shall succeed <coughs> excuse me this is a very problematic speech you know because uh, on the one hand it talks about the plight of scotland on the other hand Malcolm makes it sure. Look, you must realize the political aspirations, the political commerce that is going on in this scene. King Edward, the King of England, is helping Malcolm to gain his throne. Now, there might might be two reasons for this. Number one is that England wishes to gain some political leverage upon Scotland. number 2 is that there must be some form of pol- political friendship that has formed between them now this can be a political alliance this can be a political leverage and until malcolm has been enthroned there is no way of understanding what is in edward's mind therefore we must realize that malcolm also understands the dangers that he is putting his country in and he says look if we have a poor ruler the welfare of a country or a state goes back at least a decade or two that is true for everything like uh after hitler germany needed to rebuild itself it needed to rebuild its own image because the image has been had been destroyed 
similarly, the Scottish image has been destroyed by Macbeth himself. And therefore, Malcolm says that whoever shall succeed him shall have the misfortune of setting all the wrongs aright. And that is more difficult to do than to say. What should he be? It is myself, I mean, in whom I know all the particulars of vice so grafted, that when they shall be opened, the black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow, and the poor state esteem him as a lamb, being compared with my confineless arms. Look, this is a trick employed by Malcolm his, himself. Malcolm says that whenever a new ruler comes, usually we see that he has more vices than the earlier one. But, simultaneously, we must remember that Malcolm is still on guard. And therefore, he says that I have many, many uh, bad habits. I have many, many things in my bad nature, which would make Macbeth seem like a lamb compared to me. <coughs> and Macduff says, not in the legions of horrid hell can come a devil more damned in the evils to top Macbeth. So look, now Macbeth is no longer Bellona's bridegroom, but a devil of hell. I grant him bloody, luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious, smacking of every scene. That has a name, but there's no bottom, none in my voluptuousness. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons, and your maids could not fill up the system of my lust. And my desire, all continent impediments would overbear, that did oppose my will, better Macbeth than to such an one to reign. Now look, Malcolm says that Macbeth has every sin in him, which we know about. But at least... He does not have lust. I suffer from lust and my voluptuousness, that is my desire for flesh of a woman, is so very potent that even your wives, your daughters, your matrons, your maids, nobody can fill it up. So it's better that you keep Macbeth as the king rather than me. You see, Malcolm is testing Macduff that whether he actually wants Malcolm to succeed Macbeth or is he here as a spy of Macbeth. And Macduff says, boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. It had been the untimely emptying of the happy throne and fall of many kings. But fear not yet to take upon you what is yours. You may convey your pleasures in a spacious plenty and yet seem cold, the time you may so hoodwink, we have willing dames enough, there cannot be that vulture in you to devour so many as will to greatness dedicate themselves, finding it so inclined. So Macduff says that while it is true that human voluptuous desire, human carnal or physical desire has brought many a great king to ruin, but if you free Scotland from, from Macbeth, the tyranny of Macbeth, I'm sure that many, many women, more than you can imagine, those women will flock to you and give themselves up for your pleasure. But I personally do not think that there is such a sight in you where such a carnal desire can have its roots. Malcolm. With this, there grows in my most ill-composed affection such a staunchless avarice. This avarice is his greed for property, for land. That were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels and this other's house, and my more having would be as a sauce to make me hunger more, that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. So his desire, his greed for wealth, he says that for this I can turn the nobles against each other, 
I would take away all their lands, all their jewels, all their monetary positions. Still, you want me to be king? And Macduff says, "This avarice sticks deeper, grows with more pernicious root than summer seeming lust." And it had been the sword of our slain kings. Yet do not fear, Scotland hath poisons to fill up your will of your mere own. All these are portable with our graces will. So, Macduff says that don't worry. Quite like your lust, your avarice is also your greed. Would also be fulfilled by all the property, all the possessions of Scotland, and with other graces as well. So do not worry, Malcolm. But I have none. The king becoming graces—that is, the ideal qualities to become a king. As justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion. Lowliness means humbleness, not being very low. Not stooping down, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude—I have no relish of them. But abound in the division of each several crime, acting it many ways. Now look, this talks about Macbeth's present state. Nay, had I power, I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace, confound all unity on earth. Just like what Macbeth is doing right now. And Macduff, Macduff says, "Oh Scotland, Scotland! If such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I have spoken." So Malcolm exaggerates all, exaggerates, and he uh, weaves out of thin air a series of avarices that he possesses. Who kind of tests that whether Macduff is actually a loyal? Uh, Patriot, or is he one of the spies of Macbeth, fit to govern? No, not to live. O nation miserable, with an untitled tyrant, the bloody sceptred. When shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? Since that the trust issue of thy throne, since that the truest issue of thy throne, by his own interdiction stands accused. And thus blaspheme his breed. Thy royal father was a most sainted king. The queen that bore thee, often, oftener upon her knees than on her feet, died every day she lived. Fair devil, these evils thou repeatest upon thyself, hath banished me from Scotland. O oh, my breast, thy hope ends here. So Macduff is disillusioned. And he says that your father was a saint of a king. Your mother was such a good human being. She was such a pious, noble lady, and you have become such a devil yourself. Then there is no cure for Scotland. And Malcolm says, Macduff, this noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honour. Devilish Macbeth. By many of these strains, had sought to win me into his power, and modest wisdom plucks me from overcredulous haste. But God above deal between thee and me, for even now I put myself to thy direction and unspeak mine own detraction. That is, I free myself from all the fictitious accusations that I have made up till now. Here abjure the taints and blames I laid upon myself. For strangers to my nature, I am yet unknown to woman. Never was forsworn. Scarcely have coveted what was mine own, and no time broke my faith. Would not betray the devil to his fellow, and delight less in no less in truth than life. My first false speaking was this upon you: What I am truly is thine, and my poor country's. To command, whither indeed, before thy here approach, old Seward with ten thousand warlike men, already at a point, was setting forth. Now will together, and the chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. 
why are you silent so basically what malcolm says is that the forces of goodness are retained over here so he suggests that just all of what i have said were actually false accusations weavings of my own imagination upon myself because i was trying to test you i was trying to test your credulity and your integrity towards your own duty and i have found that this passion that you have is enough for me to trust you and as we speak old seward who is another thing is marching with 10000 soldiers towards macbeth so let us join them and then macduff is silent and he says therefore why are you silent macduff such welcome and unwelcome things at once this is hard to reconcile so now macduff is a bit puzzled he doesn't know what to think enter a doctor malcolm well more than on comes the king forth i pray you dr i sir there are a crew of wretched souls that stay his cure their melodies their melody convinces the great essay of art but at his touch such sanctity had heaven given his hand the presently amen i thank you doctor it was believed that the king edward the confessor had such miraculous healing powers that whenever he touched somebody with some melody they got healed what's the disease he means it is called the evil a most miraculous work in this good king which often since my here remained in england here remain in england i have seen him do how he solicits seven himself best knows but strangely visited people all swollen and ulcers pitiful to the eye the mere despair of surgery he cures hanging a golden stamp above their necks put on with holy prayers and he spoken to the succeeding royalty he lives the healing benediction with this strange virtue he had the heavenly gift of prophecy and sundry blessings hang about his throne that speak him full of grace so he has the healing properties which he would leave back to his next generations to his next successors enter ross see who comes here my countryman but yet i know him not so macduff is still in kind of disbelief uh my ever gentle cousin welcome hither i know him good god we times remove the means that make us strangers sir amen stand scotland where it did so look now macduff stand scotland where it did as in scotland changes position as well because macbeth has run it amok alas poor country almost afraid to know itself it cannot be called our mother but our grave where nothing but who knows nothing is one seen to smile where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made not mark where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy the dead man's knell is there scarce asked for who and the good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps dying or air the second so this is the present state of scotland because good men are dying tyranny is rampant and sighs and groans and death is the general mood of scotland right now o oh, relation to nice and yet to true what's the newest grief that of an hour's age doth his the speaker each minute thinks a new one so you are asking the recent news i can give you the news of uh i can give you a news an hour old but each minute brings new and news of death how does my wife why well and all my children well do the tyrant had not battered at their peace So Macbeth says that hasn't the tyrant uh, kind of disturbed them yet? No, they were all they were at uh, well at peace 
when I did live him. Be not a niggard for your speech. How goes it? So don't be afraid. Tell me. What is the issue? Because Macduff suspects that there is something very problematic in Ross's voice. When I came hither to transport the tidings which I have heavily borne, there ran a rumour of many worthy fellows that were out, which was, to my belief, witnessed the rather. For what I saw the tyrant's power afoot, now is the time of hell. Your eye in Scotland would create soldiers, make our women fight, to doff their dire distress. So basically Ross says that, the people in Scotland are so very afraid that even women would fight for the emancipation of Scotland, should you ask for. All they need is a leader. Need their comfort, we are coming thither. Gracious England had lent us good seaward and 10,000 men, an older and better soldier, none that Christendom gives out. So he repeats that we have seaward and we are going to march pretty soon. <coughs> would I could answer this comfort with the like, but I have words that would be howled out in the desert air, where hearing should not lapse them. So I have very bad news. What concern they, the general cause, or is it a fee grief due to some single rest? So he says, is it some general bad news or some personal one? No mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe. Though the main part portends to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. Come, I guess at it. So Macbeth has already guessed that Macbeth is after his family, but I don't know if you, I don't know if Macbeth has already understood that his wife and children are dead. Your castle is surprised, your wife and baby is savagely slaughtered to relate the manner where on the quarry of this murderer, murdered deer to add the death of you. So your wife and its children have been mercilessly slaughtered. Merciful heaven, what man? Ne'er pull your hat upon your brows. Give sorrow words, the grief that does not speak, whispers to the overfraught heart and bids it pray. So Malcolm says that do not remain so silent, Magda. Speak out your mind, because otherwise the grief will break your heart. My children too. Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I must be from thence, my wife too. And I wasn't even there. And my wife was in this world. I have said. Be comforted, Malcolm says. Let's make our medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. So Macduff's uh, reaction is very interesting. That is, first it is silence, then it is disbelief, then it is anger. And sometimes Macduff's reaction is silence, disbelief, grief, anger, finally which leads to revenge. He has no children. All my pretty ones, did you say all? Oh, hell kite, all? What, all my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop? And Malcolm says, dispute it like a man. That is, take revenge like a man. I shall do so, but I must also feel it as a man. I cannot but remember such things where that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? Sinful Macduff, they were all struck for thee. Not that I am, not for their own demerits, but for mine, fell slaughter on their soul. Heaven, rest them now. Praises, they fell for me, they died for me, because I antagonized Macbeth. So I am the one to blame, he should have murdered me and not them. Be this the whetstone of your sword, 
Let grief convert to anger, blunt not the heart, enrage it. Malcolm says that let this grief be the impetus of your revenge on Macbeth. Oh, I could play the woman with mine eyes and braggart with my tongue, but gentle heavens cut short all intermission front to front. Bring, all, bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself within my sword's length, said him. If he escape, heaven forgive him too. So he says that I pray to you, heaven, that bring him within my sword's wrench. And then if he can escape, then you forgive him as well as shall I. This tune goes manly. Come, go we to the king. Our power is ready. Our lack is nothing but our leave. Macbeth is ripe for shaking, and the powers above put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may, the night is long that never finds the day. So no matter how long the night seems, the day is always imminent. And therefore, Mal Malcolm says that the more we wait, the more Macbeth lives. So we must now haste because the time is right to end Macbeth. And we must act very, very soon. With this, I end this lecture because Act 5 is an altogether very different act and a very difficult act as well. I wanted to have a very separate video on Act 4, Scene 3 specifically because you see this sin is often, very, very often skipped by the students because they think that this scene is not that, un that interesting. But there is a lot going on. A lot of political paradigm takes place in this scene and the future of Scotland is determined by this scene. And therefore I wanted to have a separate video on this scene so that you all can understand the ramifications of this scene and the importance of this scene for its own and on its own. So that's all for today. Thank you and see you soon with some new topic and some new discussion. Uh, I'll complete Macbeth in one or two more lectures and that's it. Thank you.